I asked myself this question the other day and I was like, how do you conserve animals you know pretty much nothing about? Because you can't really protect what you don't understand. And uh, when you're dealing with an animal that all expeditions post-2000 struggle to see even once and uh, comes up short in fishery surveys every time, you're almost dealing with like quantum ecology, you know so little, every observation sort of changes everything. There are like 557 described species of sharks and three, just three out of those 500 live not in the sea but fully within fresh water and almost nobody knows about the fact that there are sharks in this world which live entirely in river and lakes. And this is mainly because when you add the hypothesized population numbers of all three species together, I say hypothesize here because we currently estimate so much as guess, there are less than 3,000 across the entire landmass of India, Southeast Asia, and Australia. We're talking about 13 million square kilometers of land, and in that, under 3,000 single sharks. Yeah, this is sort of what we're dealing with. You can see now why I call them a ghost species. Really, in the face of this sort of scarcity, science is sort of useless in some ways. You just have so little information to work with that in superstition might actually be more appropriate. But in this video, I'm going to compile everything we do know about river sharks, but don't take anything as verbatim. A lot of this, even on the scientific side, is formal speculation. The river sharks, or Goliathus sharks, are endemic specifically to fresh water and the immediate shallow coasts, which skirt the river systems from which they hail. They are so elusive, their distribution can only be broadly estimated. And Saying so, the species within this phantasmal family is limited to select few isolated regions in Northern Australia, Southeast Asia, and India. But even this umbrella estimation may soon be incorrect, as allegedly a single specimen of a certain species may have been recorded as far from this range as the African Zambezi, so it's quite ambiguous. In comparison to the greatly more numerous and notorious bull shark, who is not a true freshwater inhabitant, but a saltwater denizen compared capable of surviving prolonged intrusions into the rivers and lakes of the land for the Goliathus sharks, these nameless basins of Southeast Asia, forgotten to man and time both represent their actual native element, in which the overwhelming majority of their lives of almost every species is spent. As such, while little to nothing is known of them, examination of the few specimens we have found reveals predatory adaptations and reproductive tendencies reflecting a life bound to turbid and muddy tidal rivers, the terroir of those sedimented and tannin bleached waters being responsible for their aberrantly elusive behavior and physiology. physiology. Examining the known corporeal characteristics of the Goliath shark, in comparison to the bull shark yet again, the Goliath sharks are beasts of significantly diminished size and aggression in juxtaposition to the more abundant man-eater. Possessing smaller stature and a more debonair disposition in their interactions with humankind. But then again, this may be an impression evolved out of their extreme rarity. Indeed, many bull shark attacks which occur within the domain of Goliath sharks are falsely attributed to the latter species, especially in the Ganges. Uh, while only one confirmed attack has ever been attributed to a species within the genus of which the victim survived. The larger species, Glyphus glyphus and Glyphus garaki, can be tentatively guessed uh, to reach a maximal length of two and a half meters according to our piecemeal understanding of the creatures, but are far more commonly encountered well below the capstone as almost all specimens are yet fully grown, which only adds to the mystery of their characterization. Moreover, these spirits as they are, which seem to flit between the extinct and the extant, are a group of only five, and only three of which are alive today, the uh, missing two being long dead and belong to the waters of Myanmar and Great Britain respectively. While minor yet discriminating physiological differences are indeed present between the individual species, there are common features which remain unchanged. A more of slender needle teeth indicate a predominantly piscivorous diet. The design of the dentition desired for piercing and holding slippery prey as opposed to shearing and cutting, a trait shared by sharks of a similar dietary inclination, such as the sand tiger or mako. In the aphotic depths of the highly turbid environments these cryptids favour, it's the shark which has learned to live a life without light which is the one that succeeds. 
and uh, eons hunting in these muddied environments has predispositioned these phantom predators to a revamping of these senses over the long arc of evolutionary history. As the turbidity of the muddled muddy waters they prefer to inhabit means less than 1% of sunlight penetrates through the mud and silt clouds to the bottom, the modus operandi by which the glycosharks navigate their secluded kingdoms is one of senses beyond the sight, as do many other saltwater creatures who have chosen to adapt to a fluvial life like river dolphins. And while sharks cannot echolocate as cetaceans can, they have a different sixth sense to call upon. The eyes of all the species in this group we can see are to very extent atrophies and are supplanted instead by a dense profusion of electrosensitive pores called ampullae of Lorenzini packed into the snout. And these are present in all sharks but are exaggerated in these river ghosts. The function of these organs is the detection of the electric fields potentiated by other living creatures in the blind currents of the river, both for hunting and avoidance, as the small glyph sharks must often contend their territory with huge saltwater crocodiles, the massive large-toothed sawfish, and its distant relative, the bull shark, who possesses no qualms towards the consumption of a genetic kinsman. The mating habits and life cycles of these species are extremely ambiguous. Uh, here I want to take the time to say that despite the enormity of my research on the topic, the number of significant scientific papers which has been written on the animals as a whole can almost be counted on two hands. Uh, such a cryptic branch of species and the opaque medium in which it is found poses challenges for ecological and movement studies. Um, actually all study, or what, like um, at all. To give credit where credit is due, Glyphus glyphus, the most numerous of the bunch, has been studied an appreciable amount, but for the other species of whom less than 200 of each are alive today, the same cannot be said. We will examine the individual species within the group in a bit. Uh, with that being said, aside from the fact that it's known they are viviparous and both live young owing to their place within the broader requiem sharks, little information at all has ever been able to be gathered on the specific parameters of their reproductive behaviors. Due to the population of the species in this group is guessed to not exceed the single digit thousands um, or hundreds even, it is assumed their fecundity is extremely low. The conclusions we can tentatively draw from encounters with adolescents in this case, most individuals are born at the terminus of the dry season in the southern hemisphere in the jungle rivers and lakes most of them inhabit. Um, we can, which has been deduced from the, using the age of their umbilical scars on the freshly born individuals as an estimate for the time of paturation. Um, if we were to examine the individual species in the extant trio, all of which are thought to be critically endangered. There is the largest and most studied, which is Glyphus glyphus, which is the spear tooth or Byzant river shark, and it is found primarily in a very small handful of rivers and estuaries in the northern territories of Australia and also the south of Papua New Guinea. And then we have the second rarest, which is Glyphus glyphus, uh, Glyphus garricki, I mean, the northern or New Guinea river shark which is named after its habitat and distribution. And then we have the rarest, which is Glyphus gangeticus, or the Ganges shark. And uh, we will examine the latter one, which is the most cryptic of the three first. Um, it is the Glyphus uh, gangeticus, the Ganges shark, it's so stratified in its rarity and few of its numbers, it's almost apocryphal. And as of today, it's really unknown whether or not the species is extinct or not, as it's estimated less than 200 or less. Um, exist in its entire range of the Ganges and Brahmaputra rivers and tens of thousands of kilometers away across the ocean, the Irrawaddy River of Myanmar and the Katanabang River of uh, Borneo. As with all the sharks in the genus, but especially the Ganges shark, you can see that overfishing human development incursion into their very fragile Goldilocks habitats and pollution are what has driven this species to this ice blue line of semi-extinction. The constant inundation of the rivers like the Ganges with runoff and waste, um, as many of you might know, has rendered just their habitats not just unsuitable,
but uh, scoured of life entirely. Uh, many sections along the Holy River. Uh, recent studies have actually been found to find them completely anoxic due to the extent of the contamination. Um, so even among Goliath's sharks, the Ganges shark is an incredibly unknowable species. Uh, m- almost most cryptically, its presence in the rivers of Southeast Asia, which is like an indescribable open ocean distance from the waters of India, strongly suggests either past or present migratory behavior, but the specifics of such pilgrimages and the miasmic mecca of the depths to which these sharks make these unseen journeys, or did make in the past, is a secret of the world. Um, I don't think we will ever find out. I think it will forever remain unknown, and it will like the answer will likely die with the, unfortunately, in my opinion, inevitable extinction of the species as their habitat further deteriorates. Um, unlike the larger species, Glyphus gangeticus is actually known to prey upon freshwater rays it shares its riverbeds with, um, because we have found specimens with the barbs of their uh, prey items still embedded within the mouth and throat. And this is actually unusual considering the more petite Ganges shark is actually only limited to a maximum known length of 70 centimeters, but its physical size perhaps is not a reflection of its ferocity. Um, Although who knows if this is a true representation of the apex of their growth. It is the only species of the three which spends its entire life exclusively in fresh water. Glyphus glyphus, which is the spear tooth shark or the Byzant river shark of Australia, has had the fortune, unlike the others, of retaining a stable total population of around 2,000 due to the relative lack of pollution, as well as the auspices of um, Australian conservation efforts and funding. But uh, the changing conditions of its living zones has um, nonetheless caused the displacement and disruption of populations. Um, Recently, an undiscovered stable population uh, having been recently discovered in the Roper River of the Northern Territory in which they have never before been recorded, uh, evidencing that uh, perhaps they, um, the uh, rivers in which they choose to inhabit uh, are changing over time due to uh, the alteration of conditions in their native environments. It is um, the only one of the three species which has ever been successfully tagged and tracked due to its... Um, I, I guess that is a reflection of um, the Australian government um, have, uh, having more advanced conservation efforts, but also just due to the fact they are more abundant and numerous. And this actually revealed migratory behavior for the first time, whereby they, um, because they are, lazy, they are quote unquote lazy sharks, they descend and ascend the river body in accordance to the tide cycle, which uh, alongside the fact that the key characteristic of the larger evolutionary family of the Glyphus sharks, uh, Carcharhinidae, the requiem sharks, is that uh, most member, most if all members possess migratory behavior. Um, I actually believe this strengthens the case that the Ganges shark and perhaps others t- take or took these uh, long scale e- abyssal expeditions which are unknown to us now and uh, perhaps unknown to us forever. Uh, the related discovery of transoceanic gene flow, in fact, between the populations of the Gang- Ganges sharks in Borneo in India uh, which are, as mentioned before, segregated by thousands of miles of open ocean, um, do really leave us with more questions and answers in relation to this. The relative fortune of the spear tooth or Byzant river shark is not reflected in the plight of the northern river shark, which is the final species I will cover, um, and the final species of the three extant members of the family. Uh, Glyphus garaki, uh, Unlike the others, the rivers and estuaries for this species represent not a permanent residence, but rather this safe daycare and playground from which the sharky juveniles depart out of into the open ocean once fully matured. The adults are still stunted in appearance compared to other requiem sharks. They do uh, eclipse the two meter mark fully grown, but uh, they have only ever been caught in salt water, which is why um, we can come to this conclusion about their behavior. Their dwindling population of less than 200 is really limited mainly to the jungled fly river of Papua New Guinea and uh, less than a dozen areas in Northern Australia being reported from King Sound 
the Ord River, Doctors Creek in Northwest Australia, and a uh, myriad of far more lesser known brooks, canals, and channels of this dry, damp desert coast. These uh, places unspecified and obscure with no name given by man or God, in which these sharks, um, which it seems really no one on earth knows anything of substance about, nor has taken the time to inventory and expedite the investigation of, die out slowly in irrelevance to the world as their numbers dwindle. Um, it really is, in a way, the macabre romance of this uh, progressive end of that unknown existence, which has made me infatuated with the plight of these creatures, and from which evolved the creation of this video, and this investigation, and this interest with these ghostly freshwater beings. From the mystery of their habitats to the subversion of their conventions of salinity, they, they, they really don't really seem of the modern world. They have that rare and mythical quality one would expect of explorers' accounts and sketches in ichthyologists' notebooks, you know, from their ventures into yet undiscovered rainforest and jungle, you know, like, um, but unfortunately the world's not like that today. Anyway, I hope you learned something from this video. Um, please give me some fucking engagement, thank you. And uh, subscribe.